Fintech Chatter TV. Presented by Tier 1 People. Leaders in Fintech Executive Search. Well, welcome back. Um, as I mentioned, going to have a chat with Bianca now, a little bit about her experience as a leader. The, the, the feedback that I get from anybody in the market is just how good an operator you actually are. And so, look, I wanted to have a chat with you really about your approach to leadership, because I think it's such a, a shining example for everybody as to, particularly in, in difficult and stressful times that we're going through, there's a, there's a saying that I've got for times like this, which is stars shine brightest in the dark. As a leader, what do you consider you know, to be your kind of, your purpose in an organization? Well, uh, I, first of all, thank you so much, um, Dexter. You didn't I blush as well, very, right? I feel you didn't very blush. Very humbled by that. I do feel very uncomfortable talking about myself, but um, thank you very much. That's um, so. My purpose as a leader, I think, is really to bring the best out of um, my team at Cuskell. I mean, the only reason we've been able to achieve our success is through our people. So, uh, finding the right people nurturing their talent uh, is kind of my bread and butter. Mm. That's what my role is at Costco. Uh, I think in order to get the right outcomes, you need to have people understanding exactly what it is that you're looking to do. And so we've been really clear at Costco that our purpose, our vision is to enable the future uh, like I said, um, to deliver the connectivity and take the heavy lifting away from our clients. And so really getting our teams to focus on delivering the kind of solutions that are going to take mm. that heavy lifting and are going to be really critical to enabling success. So uh, I think that's kind of the sort of basics. I think you know, when you have superstars in your organisation, and we've got quite a few of them, really understanding what makes them tick and supporting them in their development, as well as supporting, you know, their family sometimes mm. when they're having to work really hard. Uh, so, yeah, looking after our people is probably number one job. Yeah. And, no. I, and I really enjoy doing that too, so. It's yeah. been really tough for leaders over this last few years. I think it doesn't get spoken about enough. If, in fact, if anything, you know, I think there's been this real kind of almost you know, angst against leaders who have been thrown in exactly the same situation as all of their employees. No training, no support as to how to lead teams remotely. Yeah. And yet it's just expected. And you know, there have been you know, significant challenges for everybody and being able to do that. And still, you know, there's still, I think, you know, still issues for a lot of businesses and a lot of ease leaders around how do you manage particularly larger teams remotely you talk a lot about connectivity you know and the purpose yeah. of Cuscal you yeah. know for, for its clients how have you got that connectivity within the workforce to be able to go through this this period and you know you're smashing all these goals right all these innovation first yeah well I think it hasn't been easy it takes I you know as you said no one was given a, a handbook of how to deal with the pandemic how to manage uh, a big team you know I think at the in the middle of the uh, the pandemic we were working on four of the biggest projects we've ever worked on uh, namely open banking pay to upgrading our switch and moving our fraud system to the cloud so as well as our 700 people, we had the teams involved in that. So at one point we were over a thousand people. So to, to sort of get to the end of that successfully came with a lot of hard work. Uh, I think communication was probably, is really the key to it. Uh, I don't really, no one has the silver bullet to it, but making sure that people understood exactly what was going on in the business, that people knew that you were there for them, from a sort of individual perspective, upping the ante on comms was, I, I would say it was almost a 30% overlay of what we were doing yeah. as a business. Uh, and that's kind of the general people comms as well as individual projects, as well as just check-ins. Like it, it was, uh, I think that's what got us through it, um, but it, it wasn't easy and, yeah. it, and it wasn't always successful. There was some hard times. Uh, the connectivity piece and the culture piece is something we're really trying to, we're struggling with, to be honest. I think yeah. everybody yeah. is 
uh, I speak to all of our clients and no one's got the answer to it. Yeah. I think we're all muddling through. I really do believe, though, that there has to be a, a good balance um, of in-person as well as remote. Uh, we've uh, adopted a moments that matter approach at Cus School, so you don't. There's no set days to come into the office, uh, but we do ask people to come in for moments that matter, and yeah. we have some corporate ones of those where you have to come in for our all staff town halls, uh, as well as um, you know other events that we have during the year, and then it's up to the teams and the leaders to pick what their moments that mm. matter are. So for my team, we generally come in. Uh, a few days a week where we can work together you know that conversation yeah. of hearing what's going on around you is priceless from yeah. my perspective but it, it's a real balancing act yeah. uh and i don't think anyone yeah. has really solved for it uh, you've probably seen i'm pretty vocal about this on linkedin i meet with so much resistance from people who believe that their individual productivity somehow translates to organization why productivity or a team's productivity translates to organization-wide productivity. Why do you think there's such a kind of resistance and disconnect between what business leaders are seeing and experiencing and the workforce who seem to think that, you know, they're, everything's going going to plan? Yeah, uh, uh, that's another really great question. Uh, there is definitely um, a qu quite a big ch shift um, from the employer dictating terms. I mean, no one would want to go back to that in like you know I've got two children yeah I've um, always worked for really really great leaders who supported me um, and you know I worked part-time or I worked weird mm. hours but it's always been that kind of two-way street yeah. where you know so long as you're getting the outcomes that you've agreed when you work how you work yeah. it's not a problem no one you know no one would want to go back to the point where people had to ask permission to yeah. work flexibly I, I, that just didn't work we have kind of the pendulum has shifted to a whole other space my my challenge with that is that flexible work needs to be two ways yeah and it feels with some people not everyone but some people feel it's now a one way i'll yeah. dictate terms and yeah. that's how it will be and that's not what flexibility yeah. is about. Never has been, and it probably never should be. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting that there's this been this big study in the UK about a four day work week, and it turns out that um, you know the data was they just asked people whether they felt they were more productive or not, <laughs> and then they've kind of gone and made this big study and said it's been a huge success, and they didn't talk about the other businesses that said, hey, well, it hasn't been a yeah. success for us. Um, the other thing I, I'm kind of slightly concerned about is it was based over six months and the feedback that I've been given from pretty much every one of my network and the research that I've done has been that in the first three to six months of lockdown, there were big productivity gains and then they dropped off mm. kind of fairly significantly. Um, and I, I kind of feel that one of the challenges that people have, and it's kind of a lead into the next question, is they're often doing jobs that don't give them energy that they're not you know driven by they're not passionate about they you know and it, and it feels like hey it's just this you know i'm trading my time for money yeah and you can then you get this task oriented hey well i've done what's expected of me today you know we even had what 12 months ago the phenomenon of you know doing absolutely the bare minimum and this quiet quitting thing and everybody yeah. thinking well that's perfectly acceptable and it's yeah. <laughs> it's kind of it it to me that that doesn't seem from a personal perspective because I know how bad that would make me feel. I know mm. how much it would impact my mental health. What are the things that you as a leader have have found kind of give you the energy? And as you've gone through your career and you've managed being a mum and being a leader and all of the other, and being a wife and all the other stuff that you've got to do and the soccer drop offs and you know the shopping and and everything else, how have you kind of found energy in your job to make sure that you, you you're driven but also that you've you've kind of you know been able to deliver as well I, I think probably one of my worst and best traits is my determination <laughs> so I can't let things just be that I have to get things done uh, if I'm going to do something it has to be done properly yeah so my determination I think is probably the start of it uh, and resilience probably 
particularly through um, the pandemic and lockdown mm. where it did feel a lot like you were on kind of a treadmill yeah. every day doing the same things. I think for me, uh, the things that keep me motivated are learning. Uh, so learning from people, learning from reading, learning from new experiences, uh, which thankfully in payments, that's kind of every day, yeah. which is really good. Uh, and working on things that you can see are going to make a difference which again, uh, we do on the daily at mm. School. So I think that the challenge, the learning, making a difference are the things that sort of keep me going. There has to be a purpose at the end of it yeah. or why bother? Yeah. Uh, and so that's for me personally. And then sort of bringing my team on that journey, I think you know, our team at Cost School are also very motivated yeah. to push this, all of the great things we're doing forward. So, yeah. Um You'd think we'd scripted this, right? Because my next question is, <laughs> I, I, I kind of fell into fintech and became passionate about it. I fell into recru recruitment and became passionate about it. I don't think, you know, my observation of people in their careers, I've very rarely seen somebody who went, you know, I passionately wanted to be a lawyer or I passionately wanted to be this or I was passionate about the yeah. health you know, yeah. Maybe it's the healthcare industry they're passionate about, but yeah. certainly fintech. It's not something mm. you wake up right and no. go one morning, hey, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna be in fintech. How did the, the the fintech kind of journey start for you, and and what was it that kind of drew you to the the industry? Yeah, I definitely stumbled upon it. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, when I left school, I was passionate about being a chiropractor. Then didn't enjoy that. Became passionate about being a lawyer fell out of that and in fact started cost school as the GC COSEC uh, and quickly became, you know, really energised by what might be possible. So I'm smirking here, right? If it, you, <laughs> this is the, you listen on the podcast, the reason why I'm smirking is my daughter who's 11 wants to be a lawyer. Right. And the reason why she wants to be a lawyer is she's heard guests and seen me and heard me talk about guests on the podcast. And she's asked me about, well, what, what did, how did they get that job? Yeah. And pretty much everyone <laughs> said, particularly females as well, they, they were a lawyer at first, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, I'm I, not, the, sorry, STEM, <laughs> I'm not doing much for STEM here, but. No, but I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, as much as it, we bug people, us lawyers, uh, you know, the analytic, analytical skills that you get. Um, from being a lawyer as well as litigators like me, uh, you know, the ability to present arguments and facts in a really clear way. I think it, it's a pretty good grounding yeah. for most careers in leadership that involve communication uh, and analytics. Uh, so, yeah. Which is every job as a leader, <laughs> right? Every job, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I, I, I don't see that study as being wasted and really good grounding that I bring to my role every day. Um, and so why fintech and why cost well uh, this is my first role in fintech and the reasons that I joined cost school were I was looking for a growth organization that had ambitions and also a history of execution of growth uh, I was looking for uh, something innovative I'd worked for a number of insurance organizations before that and I guess uh, innovation. Yeah, the, look, I'm the, smirking the again, <laughs> right? But it's, you know, I, I used to recruit a lot for insurers. Yeah. And originally when I started this business, I was going to focus on insure tech. And after a year, I had to just accept that there wasn't going to be any innovation happening in insurance no. for a long, long time. No, I'm hoping with CDR, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe yeah. CDR and insurance will bring some innovation. But yeah, so I was looking for growth. I was looking for innovation. I'd also worked for a number of... Um, overseas-owned organisations where uh, Australia was a subsidiary, so not much autonomy. So mm. I was also looking for a company that had its own autonomy, was in control of its strategy and execution. Yeah. So uh, that they were kind of the, the reasons that I joined, not necessarily because it was payments and fintech. That just was an absolute sort of mm. hidden bonus that uh, learning all about payments when I started was fascinating and sort of really fed my love of learning yeah. so uh and then i think the enabling the underdog as well as enabling now we enable some really big organizations but just enabling uh and 
one of the things I absolutely love about my job is understanding where our clients are looking to go, what they're looking to execute to make them really successful and how we mm. can plug into that to yeah. sort of supercharge it. So I, not just learning about our business, but learning about all of our client segments, what they're doing, what's important to them, and then how we can be better to mm. enable it. So yeah, the learning is incredible. Um, again, leads perfectly to my next question. Uh, one of the fantastic things that uh, you know I've, I've taken from doing this podcast now for over three years is that how it's, it's become almost an archive and a, a kind of learning resource for the fintech ecosystem here in Australia, whereas previously we didn't have anything like this. Now founders can go and get firsthand examples of things that work here, things that don't. Yeah the differences and the nuances between, say, the UK market, yep. the US market, um, what's happening in Asia. You know, there's, a, there's a lot that people can kind of derive from this. Um, but from your side, wh where do you go to learn? What are some of the podcasts that you listen to? Well, obviously, your podcast, Dexter. Um, but I, I think my learning, um, you, you're right, you can kind of get it anywhere like mm. i subscribe to a lot of um, email lists as well as looking at videos podcasts i think it's really important to have a look at the global context yeah. and you know i've been very fortunate i mentioned the study tour to india I've recently done a study tour to asia learn about super apps and data uh, uk open banking and then uh, stockholm to learn about digital id mm. i think Learning whether that's, you know, you have the opportunity to go to a, a conference uh, globally or, you know, just listen to yeah. podcasts that are, are readily available. I think looking at what's happened in different markets and why it's happened and then thinking about what's the problem to be solved in Australia yeah. and what learnings can you take from that is absolutely critical. Uh, I mean, I think particularly for an organisation like Cuskell where we have, we're looking to make the right bets in innovation. Like there's, like you, we just talked about digital currency. There's so many different things happening yeah. that you could invest in and go hard and deep in. Yeah. Picking the right things is really important. So uh, I think assessing what's worked and what yeah. hasn't worked in other markets. And sometimes those things won't work here and understanding why is really critical. Yeah. But yeah, learning is really important reading listening uh traveling i think yeah yeah, yeah. um and when you think right when we were early in our careers our options for learning were going and doing a night course yeah. at a college yeah. or a university yeah right <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know you kind of you, know, yeah. you didn't have the information and no. access the information that you do now even though we had the internet and yeah. you know the web it just wasn't populated with yeah. and i think that's one of the things that absolutely blows my mind is the quality of content and insights now that you've got access to 24 7 yeah. on any subject it's incredible absolutely yeah. yeah um another question for you so you know mental health is is something that's a, a real kind of challenge for all of us it's something that we don't speak about i haven't spoken a lot about on the podcast but the times that we're coming into and just you know going through my own experiences of getting older in life and more and more challenges and you know, putting on the COVID weight and all of that stuff and, you know, trying to get fit again. Um, what are some of the things that you do for your mental health to kind of keep you sharp and, and on your game and, you know, be the leader that you, you are? Yeah, so I, I think my uh, daily uh, dose of medicine is exercise. So if I get up, it doesn't matter what time I, my meetings are starting, I try and get up and do some exercise in the morning. Uh, I um, I do F45, so it's pretty yeah, um, intense, intense yeah. but very efficient. Yeah. <laughs> 45 minutes, boom, done. Uh, and I find that that um, moderates stress incredibly for me. Um, so that's kind of a daily thing. I also uh, try and squeeze in 10 minutes of meditation at least three or four times a week. Uh, and that can be done during the day, at the beginning of the day, end of the day. It's kind of not hard but also something that regardless of the crazy that can be going on around you is quite mm. um, moderating and sort of helps bring back some perspective yeah. um, in the day. Um, I think balance is really important as well. So 
there's times when you're working on a big deal or a big project where the intensity is incredible, mm. but it's critical. Yeah. Like you can't really yeah. take time out. But what's important is then to balance that at the end of that, celebrate yeah. the success and take the time out. So uh, I'm not going to say I'm I'm great at that, but I do. I mean, usually body or your mind tells you when yeah. you have to do it and you just have to yeah. listen to it. Uh, so they're kind of some basic things. I also think, you know, when um, I've had to deal with some sort of difficult um, challenges, speaking to a counsellor I found to be yeah. quite incredible. Uh, in fact, talk about efficiency, like something that you can carry around with you for a whole year in your mind thinking, yeah. how am I going to get through this issue and how do I deal with that yeah. can be dealt with in a month. Yeah, look, <laughs> so absolutely. Absolute, absolutely. Um, you know, I think speaking, getting the right assistance from the right people, whether that's a gym, personal trainer, yeah. nutritionist, counsellor, I think, yeah. you know, especially when you are really busy getting people who know what they're doing to help you with whatever the thing is you're looking for help with, uh, yeah. it's really important. Yeah. Look, as a yeah. business owner, I've seen the really negative impact of no, not doing those things and the super positive impact yeah. on the balance sheet, yeah. right? In the business of having a personal trainer, having you know, a brain coach or a counselor, yeah. somebody that can go and talk to, you know, regularly, putting in routines around mental health, you know, exercise, diet, yeah. they're so critical. And I think we kind of tend not to talk about them. You know, the other thing has just been for me, like stop drinking alcohol, right? Yeah. Uh, life seems you to be a lot up. more easy. Yeah, yeah. Li life is a yeah. lot easier to deal with when yeah. you haven't got anxiety. Yeah, <laughs> it's, totally. uh, yeah. yeah. but it's, yeah. I think it's such an important topic and it's a one that we don't really kind of discuss openly enough right it's not a taboo yeah. right it's like look it's just some changes in your yeah. routine that can have yeah. some really good impact yeah so. you're right i think it it has been a taboo historically to talk about any sort of insecurities or yeah. weaknesses um but i think if you don't talk about them and deal with them they end up yeah coming to bite you oh look i mean it's uh, it, yeah. it's almost like it's a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. right that the yeah. thing that you fear the most you know you mm. kind of focus on it that much that yeah. it inevitably comes true yeah. well thanks for joining me folks as always you can connect with me on linkedin and twitter if you're watching us on youtube make sure to give us a like and a subscribe it really helps with the algorithm and if you're listening on the podcast make sure to follow us so you don't miss an episode if you're coming back thanks so much for your support and until the next episode keep well fintech chatter tv Presented by Tier 1 People, Leaders in Fintech Executive Search.